So I guess I'll go ahead and get started with some housekeeping notes. Hello, my name is Katie Malone. I'm the Curator of Academic Programs at the McClung Museum at the University of Tennessee here in Knoxville. And I am delighted to have you guys here for our talk today with Alan Braddock called The Avian Imagination. Um, this talk is being presented as a companion to the exhibition Between the Hand and Sky, The Art of Elizabeth Gould, which was curated by Aaron Wolitz while Aaron served as a graduate research assistant at our museum. Um, Aaron's show also was developed while they were achieving their MFA and they graduated with their MFA in 2021. So a fresh new graduate. And I hope that you will go see the beautiful exhibition and work. Um, it is on view through December. There's also a fantastic companion exhibition called Ornithological Quadrupeds by, um, that features a portfolio by Bove Lyons, who's one of Aaron's mentors and teachers and also an, a faculty member and very accomplished artist um, who works at, here at UT. So with that, I'm going to introduce our speaker. Um, please note that if you want to ask questions while Dr. Braddock is talking, you're welcome to use the Q&A box. Um, that'll be the best way to kind of field those questions and I'll be happy to answer them or ask them of Alan at the end. And um, yeah, I think that's my housekeeping bits. Also, this is being recorded for posterity's sake. And if closed captionings are something that you would like, um, you can use those closed captioning features on the recording. So to introduce Dr. Braddock, Alan comes to us from William and Mary in Virginia. He um, is a professor of art history or associate professor of art history rather um, and environmental humanities. He curated the exhibition Nature's Nation, American Art in the Environment in 2018, which won many awards from CAA. Um, it was a collaboration between Princeton and Crystal Bridges, if I'm recalling correctly, is that right? It originated at Princeton and it traveled to uh, um, Crystal Bridges uh, and the uh, Peabody Essex Museum in, in Massachusetts. Excellent. Thank you. And um, he's currently developing books on global art and ecology, including one for the Getty Research Institute where he was a fellow in residence during 2019, 2020. So circa the cusp of COVID. Um, <laughs> he's also on an advisory board for the Smithsonian American Art Museum in DC. So with that, I welcome you, Dr. Braddock, and um, thank you so much for being here. Well, thank you, Katie, uh, for that gracious introduction and thank everyone out there who's uh, taking time to listen in and watch. Uh, I wish I could be there in person. I wish I could see the wonderful Elizabeth Gould exhibition and visit the museum, uh, but uh, uh, maybe another time. I do think that uh, one of the sort of silver linings about this kind of format is that uh, the pictures can look quite vivid on your computer screen. And so uh, I hope you find that to be the case. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you to uh, talk about uh, what I call the avian imagination, ornithological art and ecology since Audubon. And um, uh, what you see in the poster on the screen is a detail from one of the pictures by John James Audubon, his Carolina parrot, which was one of the 400 plus uh, specimens of birds featured in his Birds of America um, uh, uh, publication or a monumental achievement in ornithological art uh, from the uh, 1800s. And uh, just to kind of punctuate what uh, Katie was saying about the exhibition that I curated, here's the, the book and the three venues where it appeared. And um, uh, the book was this humongous 400 play page uh, tome that uh, basically uh, tries to offer a new vision of American art history uh, in light of ecology and environmental history. And uh, ornithology was part of that story, although not the entire story. And John James Audubon did play an important role early in the exhibition. There you see two photographs of the venues of the exhibition, the Princeton University Art Museum, where it 
debuted in the fall of 2018. And then the Peabody Essex Museum in Salem, Massachusetts, outside of Boston. And then the Crystal Bridges Museum of American Art in Bentonville, Arkansas, a gorgeous uh, and still fairly new institution dedicated to American art uh, founded by Alice Walton. Um, the exhibition surveyed 400 plus years of American art history in relation to ecology and uh, environmental history. And uh, I, I'm very proud of, of that project. Uh, it really <laughs> took over my life for the better part of a decade. And as Katie said, I'm, I'm now moving on to some other more global projects, but I wanted to take some time today to talk with you about Audubon and his legacy. Um, he was not the inventor of ornithological art by any means, but he's a key figure in the emergence of ecological thinking in the 19th century, because he not only made uh, many extraordinary pictures of birds like the Carolina parakeet, which you, or Carolina parrot as he called it, uh, which you see on the right, but he also noticed that uh, human beings were changing the environment and um, affecting bird populations. And his comments about that were part of the dawning uh, discovery of ecological thought in the 19th century. The portrait of him that you see at left was not featured in uh, my Nature's Nation exhibition, um, but I wanted to just show you the portrait um, which is in the White House collection in Washington, DC, uh, in part because it, it really proves how important Audubon is to the history of the United States uh, and to the history of art and to the history of ornithology in general. Before I talk more about Audubon though, I wanna just kind of uh, underscore the, the deeper history of ornithological art, uh, very briefly touching on some of the precursors of Audubon's uh, remarkable pictures. Uh, and you, uh, in a way, the ornithological tradition of bird representation goes back thousands of years, as you can see in this wonderful picture of geese from a tomb painting in Egypt uh, some 4,500 years ago. Uh, extraordinary realism, as you can see in a, a painting dedicated to a prominent uh, figure in the Egyptian uh, royal government uh, uh, of antiquity. Uh, more recently, Leonardo da Vinci, of course, the great Italian uh, polymath and humanist artist, was fascinated with birds and made an entire codex studying the flight of birds, uh, partly driven by his fascination with the beauty and, and movements of birds, but also in hopes of understanding how, how they flew and how human beings might someday fly. And he used his studies of birds to imagine early flying machines, which did not succeed in flying, but which planted the seed for the idea of human flight. Uh, Leonardo's German contemporary, Albrecht Dürer, made even more astonishingly realistic uh, pictures of birds in a series of portraits, you could say, of uh, European rollers, uh, a bird that uh, still exists today in Europe and which Dürer studied from, from dead specimens. Um, uh, the realism of his work is truly astonishing. Um, even more recently than that, um, and inspired by um, the increasingly um, global travel of, of people in the early modern period. You see works like John White's Flamingo of 1585, uh, painted as part of an early English colonial uh, exploratory expedition in uh, the Americas. And uh, at right, a painting by a, a Mughal uh, imperial Indian artist, Mansur, representing the North American Turkey, which Mansur saw in person as part of 
uh, the imperial collection of the emperor Jahangir in India in 1612, proof that uh, not only were people traveling uh, as part of a, uh, uh, an awakening global, global consciousness and colonial uh, exploration, but birds themselves were traveling, an American bird available for viewing in India. Well, that brings us to Audubon, who um, uh, arguably helps place ornithological art on a, a very firm foundation of realism and uh, artistic ingenuity in the 1800s. He was actually, uh, well, his personal story is just fascinating and I don't have time to dwell on it at length, but um, as some of you may know, he was born in Haiti, the son of a French uh, plantation owner and a ship captain who uh, actually fought for the American cause in the American Revolutionary War. But when revolution came to Haiti in John James Audubon's very early life, his father whisked the family away back to France uh, where John, young John James grew up amid the, uh, the horrors of the French Revolution and reign of terror. And it's that experience, not being directly involved in the revolution, but being aware of it through his father's military activities um, that uh, Ottoman probably became very uh, personally aware of, of the realities of violence in the human community of uh, the late 18th and early 19th century. And that kind of experience probably informed his ornithological art insofar as his bird paintings often represent uh, birds fighting and uh, acting violently in their own way. Not so much the Carolina parrot, which you see feeding on cockleburr uh, bushes and uh, interacting as a community. Um, as many of you I'm sure also know, uh, Audubon is the namesake of one of the most important early environmental protection organizations, the Audubon Society for the Protection of Birds, founded uh, in uh, the United States in the late 1800s, um, a few decades after Audubon himself had died. Uh, his art helped inspire this uh, protection society dedicated to, pro to protecting birds from uh, various modern uh, impacts, including human um, uh, exploitation of bird feathers for fashion. The great irony about Audubon, though, uh, is that while he's the namesake of one of the earliest environmental protection organizations. He, uh, of course, shot birds in order to acquire them as artistic specimens. As he said himself in a statement of 1828, my drawings have all been made after individuals fresh killed, mostly by myself, and put up before me by means of wires, etc., in the precise attitude represented, and copied with a closeness of measurement that I hope will always correspond with nature. I have never drawn from a stuffed specimen. Well, that wasn't quite true. He did draw from a few stuffed specimens, but in general, he liked to use freshly killed specimens that he had shot himself. And he shot thousands of them uh, on expeditions that he carried out uh, throughout the Eastern Americas and into Canada in the 1820s, gathering specimens, painting them in situ as the birds' uh, corpses were, were decaying before him, measuring them with calipers and translating their measurements directly to watercolor paintings, which he collected, um, more than 400 of them, and eventually had them uh, published and printed as hand-colored engravings for his Birds of America project, a truly monumental work of ornithological art. So the 
dilemmas and contradictions surrounding Audubon and this formative art of ornithology are, are rich to say the least. And the portrait of him hanging in the White House uh, and painted by this uh, important Scottish artist, John Syme in 1826, while Audubon was, was in the United Kingdom in Great Britain in the 1820s, searching for subscribers for his Birds of America project. The painting, the portrait of him, tells its own story about Audubon's keen vision and uh, loaded personality. Um, he, he, he brought a great deal of personality to the birds that he painted, in fact. Um, Everywhere we look at his art, the art, the uh, the birds are breathing with life, uh, bristling with energy, um, and he places us right before them as if uh, to to make our experience of the birds unmediated. And this was one of his great innovations as an ornithological artist. Here we are. Uh, uh, right before a white-headed eagle, an American bald eagle, somewhere on a mountaintop in America, as the bird is preparing to um, pierce that soft belly of a catfish that it has uh, fished out of a out of a, a lake or river, uh, while the entrails of other prey lie before us, Audubon uh, injected his own sense of uh, dynamism, his own personality into the birds at every turn. And uh, scientists and art historians have debated uh, the merits of that ever since. For some, uh, it, that sense of personality, that kind of anthropomorphism disqualifies Audubon's work as true science. But for others, it uh, introduces a level of dynamism and vitality in the animals that uh, uh, was unparalleled until this time. And indeed, the title that I've chosen for this talk, Avian Imagination, works as a kind of double entendre. Or it, mean, it has a double meaning. It refers to the imagination that artists like Audubon brought to the art of ornithology. But in the hands of an artist like Audubon, it even sort of refers to the imagination of the birds themselves as sentient creatures whose uh, vitality he certainly, um, he, he certainly observed and appreciated. He was also a prolific writer. And in addition to painting more than 400 pictures of birds in his Birds of America project, he published a, uh, uh, an accompanying series of volumes of what he called his ornithological biography. And reading the entries of these um, <laughs> biographies of birds is quite entertaining in its own right. And so let me read you a, an excerpt from his uh, description, his biography of the bald eagle, which is quite interesting. The great strength, daring, and cool courage of the white-headed eagle, joined to, it, to his unequaled power of flight, render him highly conspicuous among his brethren. To these qualities did he add a generous disposition towards others. He might be looked up to as a model of nobility. The ferocious, overbearing, and tyrannical temper, which is ever and anon displaying itself in his actions, is nevertheless best adapted to his state, and was wisely given him by the Creator to enable him to perform the office assigned to him. There you see in that description, I think, Audubon's kind of um, uh, sort of animation of the bird as a living sentient being that had emotions, ferocious, overbearing, tyrannical temper. Uh, Audubon sees in the birds a kind of mirror image of himself to some extent, but he also observed them uh, uh, more directly and in some ways more honestly than any artist before him. Not just their looks, but their behavior and even their intelligence. His comments here and his expression of misgivings about the eagle and its um, 
ungenerous disposition uh, points to an interesting debate going on in early 19th century America about the merits of the eagle as the national bird, the national symbol. And there was, this was quite a, <laughs> an animated political debate in early 19th century America. Uh, some, some Americans like George Washington really wanted the, the eagle to be our national bird because of its military prowess. But other writers like Benjamin Franklin uh, did not like the eagle as a choice at all. And Audubon even quotes Franklin's description and criticism of the eagle in his ornithological biography. Here are Franklin's words quoted by Audubon. For my own part, I wish the bald eagle had not been chosen as the representative of our country. He is a bird of bad moral character. He does not get his living honestly. You may have seen him perched on some dead tree near the river where too lazy to fish for himself, he watches the labor of the fishing hawk. And when that diligent bird has at length taken a fish and is bearing it to his nest for the support of his mate and young ones, the bald eagle pursues him and takes it from him. With all this injustice, he is never in good case, but like those among men who live by sharping and robbing, he is generally poor and often very lousy. Besides, he is a rank coward. Here, I think you see clear evidence that ornithology could often verge into a conversation about other topics like national symbolism and national character. And uh, so it's an important reminder that what we're talking here about here is not simply science, but also art and cultural ideas. And Audubon was keenly aware of all of these things. Um, I mentioned um, a short time ago that Audubon was very aware of the violence in nature. Uh, he did not present a kind of rose-colored glasses vision of birds, and you see that clearly in his depiction of the red-tailed hawk. This is one of the pictures we featured in the Nature's Nation exhibition because it, it really points to an important uh, early 19th century ecological insight about not only the dynamism of nature, but the violence in nature. And Audubon's refusal to idealize birds as simply cute and beautiful and peaceful uh, goes a long way to understanding emerging kind of evolutionary understanding of birds and, and nature in general in the 19th century. This picture in particular registers the violence in nature quite vividly, and it's almost hard to to look at, at up close, but I, I can't resist showing you this detail of this poor hair that's uh, gripped in the, the talons of one of the red-tailed hawks represented, a female, while a male attacks, presumably to try to take the hair away in mid-flight. And um, the scene is gory to say the least. The poor hare has blood coming out of its mouth and from its limbs. And it's so frightened it's, um, by, by the violence that it's enduring, that it's, that it's even defecating. Um, this level of realism, I don't think I've ever seen in uh, any other work of 19th century art. And we have Audubon to thank uh, for bringing it to us. Uh, this kind of dynamism, this realism uh, regarding uh, ornithological truth and violence came to the attention of none other than Charles Darwin himself, who in his 1887 uh, autobiography uh, recalled seeing uh, and hearing a lecture by Audubon at the Vernarian Society in Edinburgh in the 1820s. I heard Audubon deliver there some interesting discourses on the habits of North American birds. That word habits tells us a lot about Audubon's contribution. As an artist, he was not simply making pictures of their appearance, but he was showing us how they behaved. That brings us to, I think, my favorite uh, of Audubon's pictures, the Carolina parrot 
one that we included in uh, the Nature's Nation exhibition because of what it does tell us about the dynamic vitality of birds. Here we see not just a single bird on a, on a branch, the way uh, traditional ornithological artists like Mark Catesby represented it, but rather we see um, a community of birds interacting with each other and their environment. In this case, a cocklebur bush, which was one of their favorite sources of food. The birds twist and turn and display themselves in a variety of poses, indicating Audubon's keen attention to their appearances. And we can imagine that he has killed at least seven of these birds and pinned their bodies to a wooden board with a grid on it so that he could measure and transfer the, me um, the, the contours and the uh, dimensions of the birds directly to his watercolor page as he's painting them. One bird even uh, seems to uh, reach out in our direction with its talons, while another bird even engages us uh, as if to look directly at us. Here again is Audubon the artist. Artists had done this sort of thing in pictures of people for centuries as a way of attracting attention to their works. But Audubon here does this with an animal as if to suggest that even animals deserve our attention, our interaction, our awareness of their sentience. Let me share with you an excerpt from Audubon's ornithological biography of the Carolina parrot, uh, which reveals a great deal about the bird and its behavior and its habitat. These birds are represented feeding on the plant commonly named the cockle bird. The parrot does not satisfy itself with cockleburs, but eats or destroys almost every kind of fruit indiscriminately, and on this account is always an unwelcome visitor to the planter, the farmer, or the gardener. The stacks of grain put up in the field are resorted to by flocks of these birds, which frequently cover them so entirely that they present to the eye the same effect as if a brilliantly covered carpet had been thrown over them. They cling around the whole sack, pull out the straws and destroy twice as much of the grain as would suffice to satisfy their hunger. They assail the pear and apple trees when the fruit is yet very small and far from being ripe, and this merely for the sake of the seeds. They visit the mulberries, pecan nuts, grapes, and even the seeds of the dogwood before they are ripe and on all commit similar depredations. The, the detail of Audubon's observations here and his desire to communicate all the various species of nuts and trees that the birds eat and their behavior in doing so is, it's really extraordinary. It's not necessarily unprecedented, but the, the dynamism that Audubon imbues into the birds is pretty extraordinary. And what's more, he takes it even farther in, I would say, a kind of ecological or proto-ecological way, insofar as he connects this behavior to the response by human beings. And the human is very much a part of the, the drama here. Do not imagine, reader, that all these outrages are born without severe retaliation on the part of the planters. So far from this, the parakeets are destroyed in great numbers. For whilst busily engaged in plucking off the fruits or tearing the grain from the stacks, the husbandman or farmer approaches them with perfect ease and commits great slaughter among them. All the survivors rise, shriek, fly round about for a few minutes, and again alight on the very place of most imminent danger. The gun is kept at work, eight or ten or even 20 are killed at every discharge. The living birds, as if conscious of the death of their companions, sweep over their bodies, screaming as loud as ever, but still return to the stack to be shot at until so few remain alive that the farmer does not consider it worth his while to spend more of his ammunition. I find this an extraordinary statement because uh, not only does it observe 
the behavior of the birds and their their awareness of the deaths of their brethren, but um, it also acknowledges the killing by farmers of the birds in great numbers. And it implicitly suggests Audubon's own awareness of killing the birds in great numbers himself in order to obtain their specimens. Um, and he was so aware of this process, this fact of modernity, that he included this statement as well. Our parakeets are very rapidly diminishing in number. And in some districts where 25 years ago they were plentiful, scarcely any are now to be seen. So he recognized change, environmental transformation wrought by human intervention here in the case of uh, farmers shooting a species that was troublesome. And it's this kind of observation, along with his extraordinary art that contributed to um, Audubon and his name being taken up later in the century by early environmental protection advocates. Interesting too, by way of a discussion about uh, ornithology and ecology, is the fact that in recognizing the decline of bird populations, Audubon pointed toward the possibility of their extinction. And it's important to remember that in early 19th century America, in fact, in the early 19th century in general, extinction was still a new idea. Many people refused to believe that an entire species could go extinct. Even Thomas Jefferson, a keen naturalist himself, refused to accept the possibility that an entire species could go extinct for any reason. As Jefferson wrote in his notes on the state of Virginia, such is the economy of nature that no instance can be produced of her having permitted any one race of her animals to become extinct or her having formed any link in her great work so weak as to be broken. There in that, that vocabulary of the link uh, and, and the idea of breakage, um, Jefferson is invoking the ancient concept of the great chain of being. The idea that, that nature was created all at once in its plenitude and perfection, unchangeable for all time. That idea would become increasingly um, obsolete in the face of the environmental changes happening in the 19th century as a result of uh, uh, human intervention, the, the, the exact kind of human intervention that Audubon observed. It was a French scientist named Georges Cuvier who in his researches on quadruped fossils in 1812, verified scientifically through comparative anatomical research, uh, the fact that extinction was indeed real. Life, as he said, has been often disturbed on this earth by terrible events, calamities which at their commencement have perhaps moved and overturned to a great depth the entire outer crust of the globe, but which since these first commotions have uniformly acted at a less depth and less generally. Numberless living beings have been the victims of these catastrophes. Some have been destroyed by sudden inundations. Others have been laid dry in consequence of the bottom of the seas being instantaneously elevated. Their races even have become extinct and have left no memorial of them except some small fragments which the naturalist can scarcely recognize. As Cuvier's statement, says he attributed extinction to catastrophic geological events, but it didn't take too many more years before scientists to recognize that uh, human intervention could be another catastrophe for species extinction. And um, it was Audubon's art that gave us lasting memorials of several extinct species, that is several species that have since gone extinct. Not only the Carolina parrot, which was declared 
officially extinct in 1939, but also the passenger pigeon, the last um, specimen of which died in a zoo in uh, the early 1900s. And so Audubon's work performs a kind of ecological memory uh, insofar as it documents species no longer with us. And um, the dynamism, again, with which he represented them and, and the color and the beauty with which he represented them serves as, as a kind of lasting memorial to these now extinct species. Here, I might take a brief detour to mention uh, the work of Elizabeth Gould featured in the fantastic exhibition uh, currently on view at the McClung Museum. Uh, here is her parrot, uh, an Australian species of parrot called the Regent parrot, which she painted in 1838 during the two-year expedition uh, in Australia with her husband, John. And um, uh, I just can't uh, express enough appreciation for the Mon McClung uh, Museum for this exhibition, which I so look forward to seeing in bringing recognition to Elizabeth Gould, whose artistic contributions were long obscured by uh, the greater fame of her ornithologist husband, John. But as many historians now acknowledge, uh, without her art, John Gould's fame would not have been what it is. And it's to her that we can uh, uh, attribute uh, a great deal of ornithological insight about uh, species far afield. Indeed, her pictures of Galapagos mockingbirds and their uh, subtle species differences helped Darwin uh, uh, understand speciation, as he explained in his ornithological notes of 1836. When I see these islands in sight of each other and possessed of but a scanty stock of animals tenanted by these birds, but slightly differing in structure and filling the same place in nature, I must suspect they are only varieties. If there is the slightest foundation for these remarks, the zoology of archipelagos will be well worth examining for such facts would undermine the stability of species. Elizabeth Gould, in other words, helped the foremost uh, biologist of the 19th century uh, understand speciation. And uh, without that, we would not have uh, the theory of natural selection and evolution. Um, I mentioned a moment ago uh, the idea of anthropogenic extinction. And it was in this publication of 1848 that that became um, a scientific fact publicized uh, for the first time. Hugh Strickland and Alexander Melville's book, The Dodo and Its Kindred, published in London in 1848, included this statement. These birds furnish the first clearly attested instances of the extinction of organic species through human agency. So again, Audubon is noticing that human agency already in the 1820s and 30s and commenting on it in his ornithological biography. Uh, although it's not until this book comes, uh, comes out in 1848 that um, the science of anthropogenic extinction is confirmed for the world. Interestingly, in its focus on the dodo, uh, Strickland and Melville included a lot of art uh, including the picture you see of the dodo above, uh, as well as uh, some um, scientific illustrations that they uh, commissioned themselves from some of the few remaining skeletal specimens of the dodo, a bird that had lived on the island of Mauritius in the Indian Ocean until um, the last specimen was killed by hunters, human hunters, uh, sometime in the late 17th or early 18th century. And um, what is striking and interesting about these illustrations is their 
um, their confirmation of the role of art in this important ecological story about anthropo anthropogenic extinction. Indeed, that illustration that you see at the top is actually based on a much older painting by a Dutch artist named Roland Savory, uh, produced in 1626, very possibly from a living specimen of the dodo that he observed in the court of the Holy Roman Emperor Rudolf II in Prague uh, in the early 1620s. And so the fact that uh, these British scientists, Strickland and Melville, would reproduce a 200-year-old painting as scientific evidence in 1848 is kind of fascinating, and it attests to the role of art itself as a kind of uh, scientific document, because they knew about this painting, and they knew that Savory was one of the last human beings on earth to see a dodo alive. So that gave the picture credibility as evidence in their mind. That picture had a long lifespan, in fact, that extended beyond the 1848 uh, publication about the dodo. As you see in this uh, amusing illustration from Lewis Carroll's The Adventures of Alice in Wonderland of 1865, an illustration uh, drawn by uh, the British artist John Tenniel, based on that um, uh, now 250 year old painting by Roland Savory, a picture of this authority had a long lifespan. Here we see the dodo in an amusing vignette awarding Alice a prize ring for having won uh, a competition of racing. And she was racing with other animals. And in this uh, fairy tale, this proto surrealist book about Alice in Wonderland, it seemed only appropriate uh, for Lewis Carroll's imagination to have a dodo issue uh, Alice a prize. So art and ecology and species extinction have enjoyed a long relationship spanning centuries. Moving forward in time, I wanted to highlight a few later chapters in the, the, the history of this relationship of art and visual culture on the one hand and ecology on the other. And it was circa 1900 with the emergence of uh, an industrial trade in bird feathers for the fashion industry that the Audubon Society and other environmental protection organizations really mobilized in a big way. Uh, uh, as uh, uh, companies like Fancy Feathers, the New York Millinery and Supply Company were producing uh, birds for fashion uh, on an industrial scale and, and creating hats like the one worn in the picture at right by the English actor Pamela Graythorne, uh, a, a hat literally composed of a dead bird. Uh, the scale of this industry raised alarm bells for uh, sensitive souls who feared for the potential extinction of many species, especially species of birds that were prized for their beauty. Um, and it was in this context that the Audubon Society really took off as, a, as an organization. There you see on the right the, the, the cover of the first um, issue of the Audubon magazine published in 1887 with a picture of John James Audubon uh, and um, very, making it very clear that the, the purpose of the organization was to protect birds. At left you see uh, an illustration from another magazine, Frank Leslie's illustrated newspaper, commenting critically on the cruelties of fashion, fine feathers make fine birds. Uh, an illustration showing the hunting of birds, followed by their plucking and study, uh, and then their incorporation into fashionable attire, uh, generally worn by, uh, by women. And it's interesting to note in this context that it was 
mainly women who were leaders of the early Audubon society movement. And one of the most prominent figures, one of the most prominent women in this movement was uh, Celia Thaxter, a writer and gardener and innkeeper on the Isles of Shoals off the coast of uh, New Hampshire, whom you see in a very famous uh, artistic portrait at left by the American Impressionist painter, Child Hassam, showing Celia Thaxter in her famous garden on the island of Appledore in the Isle, on the Isles of Shoals off the coast of New Hampshire. There in the 1880s and 90s, Celia Thaxter had a kind of artist colony or salon of like-minded creative people. Um, and it was there too that she mobilized her own gifts as a writer on behalf of the Audubon movement. Indeed, she contributed an essay for that first issue of the Audubon magazine published in 1887, an essay titled Women's Heartlessness, an excerpt I give you here, commenting on the feather fashion which she abhorred. Does any woman imagine these withered corpses cured with arsenic, which she loves to carry about, are beautiful? Not so. The birds lost their beauty with their lives. Today I saw uh, a, um, a hat woven of warblers' heads, spiked all over its surface with sharp beaks, set up on a bonnet and borne aloft by its possessor with pride, 20 murders in one, and the face beneath bland and satisfied. I fear we no longer deserve these golden gifts of God. I would the birds could all emigrate to some friendlier planet, peopled by a nobler race than ours, where they might live their sweet lives unmolested and be treated with respect, the consideration and the grateful love which are their due. But still we venture to hope for a better future. Still the Audubon and other societies work with heart and soul to protect and save them. Sorry for the typos. Uh, anyway, you have this extraordinary statement by an early Audubon environmental activist uh, defining ecology in terms of uh, environmental protection and bird protection in particular, and attacking uh, an industry that she believed was contributing to the depredation of birds that she found uh, beautiful and noble. And uh, it's an important part of the story of ecology and environmentalism, I think, that women played a, a, a role of, of leadership in that movement. And it's another reminder of the importance of women like Elizabeth Gould as contributors to the formation of this kind of ecological consciousness. It's interesting to note by the way, in the painting by Child Hassam, that Celia Thaxter does not wear a hat in a kind of political statement uh, of solidarity with the Audubon Society. Uh, by this time, circa 1900, this kind of expression in art and in writing proliferated, indicating a kind of groundswell of early environmental activism on behalf of bird protection. And another vivid example of that appears in this painting by George F. Watts, a British artist who was a member of the uh, Royal Society for the Protection of Birds in England. He's painting a dedication to all those who love the beauty and mourn over the senseless and cruel destruction of bird life and beauty became a kind of manifesto, an icon of bird protection in England, showing an angel mourning the loss of birds sacrificed on the altar of fashion. Um, it's out of this context that Audubon, uh, possibly uh, the greatest 
successor of, of Audubon and Gould in ornithological art of the early 20th century, Louis Agassiz Fuertes emerges as a, a truly astonishing artist and realist of uh, bird representation. Uh, the son of a Puerto Rican uh, pr um, engineering professor at Cornell University, he fell in love with birds and traveled the world uh, capturing their beauty from, from Alaska, as in the Pomeranian Jaeger seen here, to Ethiopia, seen in this extraordinary silvery-cheeked hornbill. Fuertes, uh, Louis Agassiz Fuertes, provides an important bridge between Audubon, whom he greatly admired, and uh, the earliest commercially available field guides to birds, as in Roger Torrey Peterson's uh, 1934 field guide, uh, which you see here, a very early uh, effort on the part of an ornithologist to publicize and popularize birding. Birding had, of course, a long history. Bird watching, ornithological art, as we've seen, goes back centuries. But the popularization of birding appears in the 20th century uh, in a real way with these commercially available guides, which very much follow in the tradition of Audubon and Gould and Fuertes, indicating the role of art in relation to ornithology and ecology, and ecology all along the way. It's with uh, Rachel Carson's Silent Spring of 1962 that um, the idea of the bird and its fragility as, as a life form became a, a, a truly global environmental phenomenon. The title of Rachel Carson's great book, Silent Spring, uh, uh, a critical indictment of reckless use of DDT and, and other chemical pesticides in the post-World War II era. Um, the title of the book comes directly from the experience of birds and, well, their absence, their silence uh, in spring threatened by um, the overuse of, of industrial pesticides. Uh, and while uh, Rachel Carson is not often seen as an artist, she was a gifted writer even before Rachel, uh, uh, even before Silent Spring. She was a very popular uh, nature writer. And uh, if you haven't read Silent Spring, I strongly recommend it. It's one of the most beautiful books I've ever read. It's, it's just a, a model of um, what I would call public science and citizen science in its uh, uh, integration of scientific information with storytelling in a way that makes the science accessible to a broad audience. And, and that, that accessibility was enhanced by um, uh, the inclusion of, of illustrations in the book by the husband and wife team of illustrators, Lois and Lewis Darling whose uh, pictures appear as the frontispiece for each chapter. And here you see as, um, an example of that at the beginning of the chapter titled, And No Birds Sing. And by the way, the, that title uh, reveals Carson's literary sensibility because it comes right out of a poem by uh, the British poet, John Keats, uh, La Belle Dame Sans Merci, where he referred to, um, Ah, uh, what can ail the wretched white, um, alone and palely loitering? The sedge is withered from the lake, and no birds sing. The idea being that um, um, when the environment withers, the birds disappear, and the spring becomes silent. And a sense of that disappearance and silence is communicated eloquently in the Darling's illustration showing um, a lonely nest with eggs uh, unguarded by the parents who have disappeared somehow, presumably um, died from, from chemical pesticides. That's the insinuation. What's more, the nest floats 
precariously in space with no background, uh, hauntingly suggesting disappearance and death. It's a, a very, uh, extra, it's an extraordinary image and further proof of a, a kind of legacy of ornithological art here participating in one of the great manifestos of ecological consciousness. Um, in the aftermath of um, Silent Spring, um, more and more artists get on board and join the bandwagon of ecological thinking and environmental protection. And the, the artists range widely in their style and their approach. Here, I wanted to share with you a work by the artist Robert Rauschenberg, who is associated with the avant-garde, a very experimental kind of mode of artistic creativity using photo collage. Uh, and here, promoting the first a major Earth Day celebration in April 1970. Rauschenberg created this poster to promote the American Environment Foundation, in effect lending his art to uh, environmental activism. And uh, his picture sort of creatively brings together a collage of images from uh, endangered uh, African gorillas to scenes of pollution and all centered around this image of the American bald eagle um, represented in a kind of sepia toned uh, uh, photograph ripped from a magazine. The sepia tone suggesting aging, yellowing with time. Uh, creatively implying that this bird, this most important and iconic of birds, might be uh, slipping into historical memory. And indeed, at that time, because of DDT, the, the bald eagle was an endangered species. And it was only through the work of many environmentalists and artists that uh, the ecology of the bald eagle was uh, 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 rectified and the species has made a return. I see that I'm running out of time. I could go on for hours, but I think perhaps I should bring this to a close and just thank you again for uh, making this possible and allowing me to share some time with you. And uh, I just leave you with the, the thought and the hope that when you think of ecology, you'll also think of art because they've uh, they've been in a long relationship together for, for centuries. Thanks very much for your time. And I welcome your comments and questions. So we do have a question in the chat. Um, okay, in the chat? Well, in the Q&A. <laughs> Q&A, okay. Uh, so the question is regarding, um, given the importance of botanical illustrations to botany and plant ecology, do you feel that there are parallels between botanical illustrations and ornithological illustrations? Oh, absolutely. In fact, you know, another artist I could have included here was uh, Sibylla Marion, a, a fantastic uh, 17th century uh, Northern European botanical illustrator who was also a keen observer of birds and insects. And her published illustrations are another great landmark in this tradition. So indeed, they go together. And, and Audubon, as you saw with his depiction of the Carolina parrot, was very much aware that the, the favorite habitat of that bird species was the cocklebur bush. And so he felt obligated to represent it faithfully as well. Um, indeed, great question and absolutely. And I have one more question. And okay. if anybody else has any, please fill them in. But um, I wanted to know that, you know, in Audubon's writings and in his illustrations, you can kind of see that he as you mentioned, kind of links himself with the birds in a way. Maybe he mm -hmm. organizes them, but he sees them as full animals and their full violence and beauty. Mm -hmm. uh, and I wonder if, as he started observing some of them disappearing, if he started to express compassion for them in a way? Yeah, that's a great question. Yeah, He, he definitely repeatedly 
expressed concern about populations, um, uh, most famously in relation to the, uh, the great auk, um, an, uh, an Arctic bird species that he tried to find on a trip to Labrador in the 1830s, but couldn't because they had been so thoroughly hunted and, and their eggs were stolen by what he called eggers. And um, yeah, it, I think that he did kind of identify with the birds in a way. And people have written about this sort of weird psychological dimension of Audubon where he would often uh, comment on their familial relationships and his writing could become quite flowery at times. And some historians have suggested that in doing so, he was also kind of projecting his own nostalgia for his, his own family, because he would have to leave them often for months at a time and be out there in the bush, either alone or with a few assistants. And so he missed his family and he kind of enjoyed the bird families as a kind of vicarious experience of familiarity. And uh, so, but I, I guess I would also suggest that it wasn't just sort of hokey nostalgia or anthropocentrism, but there was a real observation going on of their behavior. Because again and again, he also commented on, on their intelligence and how certain birds knew when a hunter was present because they recognized the gun and would immediately fly away. Uh, and they could, they could recognize uh, human behavior. Um, sometimes he perhaps overdid those kinds of comments, but a lot of it was born of real knowledge of their behaviors. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure if I answered your question, but I, you, did, you, you can tell I'm pretty enthusiastic about Audubon, despite, you know, the fact that he was a, <laughs> he was a cold killer of them, you know, he would kill thousands of them in a year, gathering up the, the specimens that were least damaged by his buckshot, so that he could use them as models for his art. Um, yeah, it's a real conundrum. My cat got very upset by <laughs> talking. Oh, I'm sorry about that. <laughs> um, here's a question. With the advent of digital photography, is the prized skill of ornithological il illustration dead? Well, no. I, I mean, thankfully, I would say that ornithological illustration is still alive and well. And I could show you some more pictures. I mean, Andy Warhol is an interesting creative example. but. Uh, Alexis Rockman, an extraordinary kind of scientist artist who hangs out with evolutionary biologists and doesn't just depict birds and other species realistically, but imagines almost fantastic evolutionary mutations in the future. As you see here in these toucans that are kind of connected with other birds or have unusual and seemingly improbable uh, morphological changes. Rockman is an extraordinary realist, but he injects into his work a great deal of imagination as well. Um, I think the artist Maya Lin, while not a painter, is in her own way um, a very scientific artist, not limited to birds, but very digitally smart. And her What is Missing project, I urge you to look at because it's this wonderful, dynamic, interactive, digital project about species that are missing and endangered. Uh, a kind of crowdsourced public science project with pictures and video and texts, historical and contemporary, and information about uh, solutions to environmental problems. And so I, uh, thankfully, I don't think ornithological art or environmental art is at all threatened by the 
uh, the technology of digital representation. Uh, are there other questions? Let's see. Oh, you, the, the, the AUK. Uh, I don't know what to say about the Guadalupe Caracara, Paul. Uh, so I uh, please tell me. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm not an ornithologist myself, and I'm a very pathetic bird watcher, although I have done some bird watching. Uh, but um, uh, I have a lot to learn. I'm mainly an art historian and wannabe ornithologist. So I, I will look up the Guadalupe Caracara, which I assume is a Mexican bird that uh, perhaps went extinct. Um, forgive me for not having an answer to that question. Um, well, I think that we have definitely hit our time and answered okay. all the questions from the audience. I could ask 5 million more questions, but I want to be respectful of everyone else's time. So I want to thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Braddock, and I want to thank all of our guests for participating and listening so intensively, or intently rather. Um, yeah, please come visit the McClung Museum and uh, see these two fabulous exhibitions. And thank you so much. I will be sending out the recording so you guys can share with your students. Okay. Have a thank wonderful you. day. Take care. Bye-bye.